السلام عليكم ان شاء الله الحمد لله رب حمدا طيبا مباركا فيه وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اما بعد رب اشرح لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الهزم اذا شئت سهلا السلام عليكم انا اظن راح يسال بفوق كان قاعد زي اول ويك Last lesson, we covered just an introduction and a very simple, which is the principle of that in all times and all circumstances, there are reasons for our excuses. And to overlook that is the only way that you are able to then be successful in acquiring the deen. Inshallah, today we've got a small, small principle again. So we'll look at all these principles before every single class so that we create a character that then is able to acquire the deen. Open the deen. Okay. So our second principle today, inshallah, is it's a small story from the Sahaba. One of the Sahaba, people started coming to him after battles and they asked him as to his success how comes in every single battle in every single battle he was able to be successful in all of them and not lose any of them and he came and he told one of them to come forward and then he told them one that individual to put his finger in his mouth and he told him to bite his finger and then he told him I'm going to tell you to go and then to bite as hard as you can. I'm going to bite as hard as you can. And we're going to see which one lets go first is the one who lost. And the one who maintains himself is the one who has won. So they started biting. And this individual that came forward was one of the strongest amongst the Sahaba, amongst the Tabi'een. So he started biting in hard, but after a while he gave, he gave up. So he told him, why do you think that I was able to keep going while you gave up. He said, because you're stronger. Your jawline must be stronger than mine. And he said, no. I, I kept telling myself that any second now, he's going to give up. And that perseverance, that mentality, that any second now, success will come. Any minute now, will be able to overcome is that made me more successful than you. Not the actual reality that you are stronger than I am or I am stronger than you. So we learn from this that it is not important that you find something easy or that you are able to study something and you're not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask for you to be successful. He asks for you to strive. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And to strive in the way of Allah. He does not ask for your end point. That is for him. And he judges whomever he wishes to be successful, he makes successful. And whomever he wishes to be in a state of loss, he puts him in a state or he puts her in a state of loss. So, we learn from this. That in our studies, in our day-to-day -day life even, that we keep going and we keep striving and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open a door for us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا And the ulama have said that this is firstly translated is whomever has taqwa of Allah, Allah opens the door for him. 
that it's not necessary that you see where this fath is going to come from, where this opening is going to come from, but it's just important that you keep striving and you keep going. So I advise you, inshallah, on top of the lesson that we learned last week, which is to not give excuses, we, inshallah, should keep in mind to keep going. There is a very important thing that my brother taught me before he started teaching me books, which was the first time he went to a lecture, there were 200 people in that lecture. He said, when we finish the kitab, we finish the book, that there were two people left, him and another brother. No one else was left. So perseverance is the thing that keeps success going. And we're going to learn that today in one of the lessons, in the lesson, inshallah. That's the first point. The second point is, what are we going to cover in this lesson? What we're going to cover, inshallah, in this semester is what is most important to you as an individual. So the first and the most important thing to you is the fundamentals. So why is first we need to keep keep an understanding of what the please put your phones on silent and I'll try to do this. So what is a fundamental? Can someone tell me what, what is the essence? What what do I mean by learning the fundamental? This is not a khutbah. You can speak. Yes. Can someone add to it? What is necessary? Conduct yourself. Go on. That's a good point. And that's with, it, with regards to Islam. But we, the word fundamental meaning. So when you say when you cover it's, it's the fundamental thing, what are you covering? The basic idea. What is the idea that you cover with regards to Islam? We have a deen. We have a we have a messenger from that law. What are the fundamental basis basics that we do, we require to cover in order to hit the bench line, not to go above, to hit the basics in order to be stable, what do we need to know? So a ripple that I found a lot of people using, a lot of the ulama use, is the foundation of a house. Now, when we look at a foundation house, do we see it? So the fundamentals of a Muslim are very intrinsic within him. It's not necessary that you see it in his day-to-day -day life. Is it in any case good looking or is it the first thing a person looks at when they're buying a house? No. But is it necessary? Yes. A person comes into buying a house and they think of what? Everything else except the foundation because the foundation is expected to be there. Because if it's not there, no one will buy that house. Who will buy it? Then how do you accept, expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept you without the fundamentals? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot stand in front of Allah without the fundamentals. You will have nothing to stand on. So, that is the first point with regards to understanding the fundamentals of Islam. The second point is that, when does the fundamentals come to show? So when do you really see that a person has the fundamentals? Or a house has its foundation is very strong. In times of difficulty, in times of hardship is when you find, and that's why in areas where there's earthquakes and things of that nature, that you're going to have reinforcements on the foundation, right? Is that in times of hardship will you know who you really are? And in times of hardship, likewise, are you going to find out if in reality you have a foundation or not? If you are, mashallah, a good speaker, Oh, mashallah, you're a muttaqi, or you see yourself as someone, mashallah, you cry, you pray your five times a day, but when the fitna comes, you don't pull through, there is something wrong with your foundation and your fundamental understanding of the deen. And that is the thing that trips most people in the grave. And that is the first thing we're going to cover, is what is fundamental for you to know in the grave. Your Lord, your deen, and your Nabi, your Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in terms of hardship, that's what's going to come across. So that is inshallah what we hope to cover. The second point and the second book that we're going to inshallah cover is the most 
to know the most hated thing to Allah. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the most. And the third book will be on the most admired and the most primary and the most essential act in Islam. So what do you have after this semester, inshallah, if you come to every lecture and you are attentive and you read and you do all your homework, what you're going to have is firstly you are going to have a strong foundation with regards to your grave. When you go to the grave, you will know what to say, why you're saying it. And inshallah, Allah is going to keep you strong upon the deen. Secondly, you're going to know what Allah dislikes because there are certain things that Allah loves, there are certain things that He likes, and there are certain things that He dislikes, there are certain things that He hates. Now, in our nature, we have become very lax, is that we hear something is makruh, we don't realize Allah dislikes it. And we think, oh, it's just makruh. This is something Allah dislikes. How far are you going to go with Allah before it hits a point that you can't return from? Do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hate you, then you're going to return? Or you're going to stop what is disliked, and you're going to do what he likes and what he loves? That is the point we need to stop at. The point is what he likes, not what he dislikes. That is not... That is a point of loss. You're already in, in, in loss. So, and that is salah. A lot of people, can you just have a hand, hands, inshallah, um, hands up. Most of their salah comes from their parents, as in like how their parents pray. That's initially how they pray. When, when you put your hands up all the way up, there is no fear and put your hands up. Okay. So most of us learnt our salah from our parents. Now, it's, it is important in Islam that we understand that it, it, it is not necessary that our parents know the haqq even within our madhab, that they know the essentials. It might be that they did exactly what you did. So somewhere along the line, there might be a habit that you picked up, or they picked up, or your grandparents picked up, that your grandparents picked up that you didn't even know about. And later on, they will come when you're 64, 70, inshallah, way past that, and you, and you pass away. The reality comes. And all your salahs will be gone. Because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there will be a person who comes in the Day of Judgment having paid 60 years of salah. All of it is not counted. Why? Because he did not look at the very fundamentals of his salah and he did not carry it out properly and he forever left it in a position where he learnt it or heard it from someone else and never looked at the sources. So that's what we're going to look at. <coughs> Firstly. So inshallah today we're going to start first book which is the three fundamentals of Islam three foundations of Islam and the three fundamental principles that you need to understand in order to carry your uh, you carry your deen in a particular order. Why is it important to carry or to learn your deen in a particular order, in a particular way? A certain madhab. Why do we have madhab? What is the need for all of this? Hands up. Again, it's not a khutbah. It's fine. Say anything. Why do we need order? Go on. To explain it and to put it in a structure. Why is structure needed? Because it's, it's the only way you understand. Without structure, understanding becomes very difficult. So there's, there's, a, there's a tertiv, there's a way of learning, acquiring knowledge. What this society has really fell on is that it doesn't teach people how to learn. It just teaches them a lot of information. So what people have is they don't have the importance of certain knowledge over others. Everything is relevant. And we only pick up things because we need it for money. Right? The only thing we focus on is the end of the exam. Because the exam equates to a grade. And the grade equates to a career. Food. We have become very primal, very animalistic in our acquiring of knowledge. It is something that benefits me immediately, otherwise I'm not going to pick it up. So we need to learn what are the fundamental basis and the principles and the, and the tariq, the way that you acquire knowledge. So, the first principle that we're going to cover and the most important thing is, the shift firstly starts with, With, no, 
And this is to get your attention. That if someone says to you, you need to know this. Well, brothers and sisters, please focus in. You need to know this. You're going to be attentive. What is it that I need to know about Allah? Right? Instead of just getting into the, into the, into the speech, the Sheikh starts with I'lam, know. And then he makes dua for the student. So he makes dua for the student, and this is the sunnah of the ulama, it's the way of the ulama that they make dua for their student. Why? Because they are the inheritors of the Prophet, and they will inherit them. So the students then are going to be in the position that they are in. So they make dua for them, so that they may, inshallah, be able to, and Allah gives them the strength to carry what is very heavy. Not in our account. We might be weak and find things heavy. No, in regards to Allah stating it being heavy. So he makes the dua. Rahimakallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy and have pity on you. So that he may aid you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid you. That, uh, that he says then there are four things that are three things that are very fundamental and very, very necessary, really necessary for you to know. And the first is ilm, knowledge. Why is Answer? Something? Go on. Go on. Um, without knowledge, you know what you're doing. Uh, you know the thing. So that's um, knowledge and you don't know what you're doing. It's how you're copying. Even having like, experiences that you pick up from your society, all of it is on knowledge. There is nothing have has it. A person like that is insane. He doesn't have it happen. It, you require him to carry it out. If you know it, it's not even it's not possible for you to carry it out. So you require knowledge. Principles to knowledge. Inshallah what we'll do is we'll have we'll have the lectures. Um I want to have it in paper form like this, but the Sheikh advised against it and he said have it in a form that they have their normal lectures. So would you like would you like PowerPoints or would you like normal written? Hands up for PowerPoint. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hands up for paper. Just continuous. Okay. Okay. So, so okay. Khalas, inshallah, we're gonna have it in just normal paper form then. Uh, so there are six principles to knowledge. So knowledge, you have the first principle of Islam, knowledge, and within knowledge there are six principles. The first principle, ask, and you pursue. A lot of people have no when it comes to disobeying. If you have no from sin, how can you have shyness from attaining reward and attaining ilm? There is no shyness in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no regards to the truth. Come in. We are not with regards to the truth. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not with regards to the truth. The second principle, hope you're writing this down. The second principle is listening and being silent. Listening and being silent. There's a quotation from Ali radiallahu an that it is he said that it is more beneficial for you when acquiring knowledge that you are silent and you speak. That you come out coming out station or coming out with additional notes or saying or speaking when the teacher is speaking is less for you than to then to be silent and to listen. And brothers and sisters, there's a difference between listening and hearing. Hearing is involuntary. When you go into a shop and you listen and there's music, that's hearing. 
You don't necessarily get sins for hearing. Nor do you necessarily get rewards for hearing. But you are for or sin with regards to your listening. And listening is active hearing. That you choose to hear what is being put out there. So do not get confused between I heard something and I am attentively listening. Why is that the Sahaba? And they would listen and know it word by word because they wasn't just hearing what he was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were listening. They were in the moment. It wasn't thinking about something out, oh, I have, I have something to do then. And I, no, listening to what is being said. So you listen, you don't hear. The third, number two, the third is understanding. And the ulama have said that understanding is more important than memorizing. MashaAllah, a lot of us, you will see that there are a great number of people that have memorized the Quran. But don't even know Arabic, as in, it's... It is just speech. The memorization is important. And the fourth principle is actually memorization. But understanding is more crucial. Memorizing something without its understanding doesn't weigh anything. It has no weight. It's just you are a record. You just record things. You're, 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 you're just... In, in, in you're not utilizing that information because you have no understanding of the information. The, the fourth one I've said is memorizing it. The fifth one is that ilm is acted upon. And this is actually the third principle that we're going to cover, so I won't go into this in depth. It's that it is, it is something that you require to act on. There is no, there's no need for ilm if there's no action. And you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks in the Quran, a lot of the times, be attentive. Actually look at what he's saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you hear what he's saying, he speaks about what? The people who do wrong and the people who do right. But remember, there are people that don't really do much. They're just in the background of people that do right or wrong and they're just irrelevant. You will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention them a lot. Why? Because people that have no actions to put forward, have no value. No negative value and no positive value. They have, they're nothing. They're non-existent. That's why Ahad bin al-Ulama, one of the scholars, he said that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of knowledge, he doesn't ever talk about someone who acquired knowledge and didn't act upon it. And this is shown in Surah Yusuf. We're not going to go to inshallah into detail. But this is shown in Surah Yusuf. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak about people that who have acquired knowledge and have not acted upon it. Knowing, meaning that this, these are in a state of zero. They're, they're, they're nothing. They haven't shown to be disobedient. They haven't shown to be obedient. They just lack. Okay, so we've covered five points. So the sixth point is to teach. Part of knowledge is to teach that you convey the little that you have and I expect every one of you inshallah to convey some of this if not all of this to their family members Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu qū anfusakum wa ahlīkum nāra Assalamu alaykum That he said O oh, you who believe protect yourselves and your family members Why not just yourselves? Because the person who has his family member in great first of all who here can bear their parents their mother or their father or their brothers or their daughters or their sons or their husband in now no one can bear this you need to teach them because you will not bear angels striking down at your parents and angels have no regard feelings once you've disobeyed Allah and you will not be able to do much 
if you do not do much here. If you don't give da'wah now, how do you protect them in Yawm Al-Qiyamah when you have angels striking their backs and dragging them? These are your parents. I want you to picture your parents because this will happen or it will not happen. There is not, there is not a maybe or it will either happen or it will not happen based on the fact that you gave da'wah or they were on the right path, mashallah. So we need to teach before it's too late. So that's the six principles of ilm. And brothers and sisters, I want you to put your pens down and to listen, to look. All of you listen. Look carefully. Knowledge, it's fundamental we're talking about. Fard Ain, Fard All acts really narrated in the major, and some of the scholars have said that it has some forms of deficiency. The scholars have said that it's Sahih, among them is Asiyuti and um, Sheikh Al Albani. And many others have said that this is Sahih, that it is wajib on you to acquire knowledge with regards to this affair. Now, you are all, I want you to listen to this, you are all here, we are all here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done a number of things. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, says, Man yurid Allahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fi al-deen. And the letter into two. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for. Remember, He wants good for you, yufaqihu fi al-deen. He gives them the understanding of the deen. He gives them knowledge. But he understands what he knows or what she knows. So the fact that you are here now means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you. That is saying something. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has acted and has done something with regards to every single one of you today. And he has put you here. So that you may benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to accept your repentance. When he wants you to turn to him. Wa yuridu alladhina yattabi'una shahawati an tamilu maylin azima. And he wants those of you who has fought and have followed their decision to turn back, not momentarily, but in complete return. No question. Most of you are very young, you have no recollection. You don't know that when you go older, you start making, or you might have started already, you start making excuses. So, mashallah, you pray five times a day, but you know, Akhi, the thing any need a loan, and you know, I can't live anywhere. Where am I going to live? I need to make mortgage, riba Do you get it? You start making, rationalizing your affairs with regards to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to turn back in complete, complete return. I've seen brothers, and mashallah, you know, they say, you know, Instagram or Facebook, something more relevant to our day. It's fitna. Right? And he says, you know, it's fitna. I'm like, okay, let me let me delete the people that you think are fitna. Right? And when I this happened, I started deleting and he said, No, 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 okay, leave, leave that one. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's not go extremes here, leave, leave this one and this one. And that actually happened. How do you accept expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you if you're like, no, no, hold on, wait, I, I still want to hold on to that one though. How is that possible? It is not possible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done two things for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to benefit right now. And he has shown it by bringing you here today. And secondly, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return to him and for him to accept your repentance. 
So I ask you, brothers and sisters, I ask you very sincerely, very, very sincerely, what are you going to do in return? What are you going to do in return? If you cannot think of something, you're in dire situation. You need to do something back in return. Subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ If you are thankful, being thankful goes drops into three. First is the heart. Secondly is to say it, that you are thankful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Alhamdulillah. And to mention it a lot. And the third is action. And we're not going to go into details. But whoever wants to actually go into details, there's a book by Sheikh Ibn Al-Qayyim that he writes on being grateful and he talks about it there. So, there are some brothers, look at here, there's some brothers, I'll come in, it's okay for me. So you require, you are thankful. Okay? Now we can go back to writing. You are writing. You are just listening. <laughs> So write down, knowledge is split into two, which is fard, fard al ain and fard kifaya. That is compulsory, one's compulsory, and one is advisory. It is advised that you do it. Okay? Alright. The third principle is that you act on it. Brothers and sisters, I want you to listen to a very simple principle amongst the scholars. That knowledge calls out knowledge calls out for action. If action does not respond, knowledge leaves. This is a principle. So listen again. Knowledge calls out for action. If it doesn't receive a response, knowledge leaves. You understand? So, action and knowledge are interlinked. And, not, and action and iman are interlinked. If you are acquiring knowledge and you do not act upon it, the knowledge has left. If you <coughs> act upon it, iman comes. Brothers and sisters, you need to focus on this principle that knowledge is linked with action. On the presence of, uh, presence of action comes Iman. And if you don't have Iman and you're not acting upon what you know and leave and soon you will be nothing. So action is the second principle. The third principle, the third principle, being patient and persevering. Brothers and sisters, we lack in this. We lack in patience and perseverance. <coughs> I remember I was in Egypt and one of the brothers was sitting down with one of the shifts and he was talking about what he had to do to come here meaning Egypt. And some of the things that he said were very difficult. He do a great many things. Things in terms of very gang related things that if you were to leave your life is in danger. So the Sheikh reminded him of another Sheikh. Recently in one of the countries that claim they're Muslim countries that the Sheikh was told to give a fatwa with regards to Ramadan. The Sheikh refused because he said this is haram. They took the Sheikh and they removed his skin from his toes up to his heart until he no longer had life in him. This is presently happening. And the Sheikh told me 
at no point did he stop recite, reciting the Quran. No point did he stop. No screaming, no shouting, no negativity. No, why do I have to go through this? Maybe there's a need, it's necessary, my life is in danger. None of that. It was as simple as he was reciting the Quran and the person who was doing this for him felt so ashamed and so sorry for him that he pierced his heart. And the Sheikh died there. The Sheikh was teaching as well. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. More severe than what you are going through. All this team, previously, present, in the future, no doubt, there are those who sacrifice for their deen, their messenger, and for their Lord. The question is, will you? That is the only question here. It's regards to you. This deen will be successful. Are you going to be on board? That is the only question. So we need to learn to be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salah in Allah Ma'asabiri, you who believe. Hold steadfast to patience, being steadfast and salah. In Allah Ma'asabiri. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the patient. If you are under difficulty and you are being patient, Allah is with you. <coughs> if you forsake your trial, So we need to realize, brothers and sisters, that the Sahaba are being put in ditches. Do, does anyone know the first person who died for Islam? Does anyone know how she died? You know what else they did? Because that, that, that only would not, would, not, would not get the... It wasn't satisfied with just that. What they did to her was... They put each arm, they put a rope on each arm and each leg. Then they tied the rope to a horse. Then they whipped the horse to a point of as as though he had no option but to run. And to run as fast as he just as possible. And at the point of which the horses reach and the person is fully spread out. They took a spear, they planted it, and put the spear in her private parts until she was cut in two. Who is coming to the Prophet A family member has come. What is he asking for? When is Allah going to help? When the Rasul got angry. Brothers and sisters, I want you to feel it. Listen to this. He didn't say, be patient. He said, he got angry. Why? Because the Rasul knew what the Ummahs of before had done for their deen. To keep on to their deen. And that we wasn't hitting the benchmark. So he wanted the Sahabi to feel, to remember that before you, he said, before you people, would have been tortured and they were stubborn on steadfast on them. and today wallahi you are told to do something simple for Islam and you let it go and the problem is it's because we're in a we're in a state it's not ni'mah ni'mah wallahi this is not ni'mah wallahi this is not in a state this is not a good thing Anyone who thinks that the fact that they're in ease is a good thing needs to recalculate. We need to look over things again because it is not an, an, it's not a good thing that we're in. Okay? Just a small point. Actually, we, have, we haven't got much time. What is the evidence for these principles? The evidence for these principles are stated First of all, Imam al-Shafi'i, which is one of the four Imams of Fiqh, one of the prominent Imams of Islam, 
stated that if Allah, Allah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down the evidence that we're about to give and nothing else to his creation it would be sufficient if you just sent this down and nothing else just this it would be sufficient but you will find that always Allah goes more than the extra mile and what is the evidence by time and brothers and sisters when we say wallahi billahi what we signify what we're about to say we're swearing why do we swear to put significance on your statement Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time to put significance on what what he's about to say next innal insana lafi khusr most of us know this surah that all of mankind is in a state of complete and utter loss nothing is left illa alladhina amanu except for those who have believed and belief is not possible without what we what have we said brothers and sisters iman is not possible without an action and action are not possible without knowledge so except those who have iman I will have knowledge the prerequisite and then they followed up that Iman with what? action continuous action that you keep going again and again and again and they advise one another they tell one another they put forth and tell them and urge one another on patience sorry on the truth and on patience so if we look you will find all four principles illa alladhina amanu bi dalil fi ilm wa amilu salihat bi dalil fi amal for action wa tawasaw bil haqq bi dalil the proof that you advise one another towards the truth the the, the, the dalil for da'wah to call on what you have been taught wa tawasaw bisab I'm sorry I think in my notes I missed out the, the the third principle is spread into two which um, patience, perseverance and truth to call to what you have learned so to reinforce this, Imam Al Bukhari states that in his in his kitab, we all know the Sahih, that in explanation of in 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 the in the, in the bab in the in the chapter of let me just that knowledge is a prerequisite to act actions and sorry uh, to, 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 to speak and he stated that the proof for this is that you need to have this is fi'il amr this in, in the Arabic language this is an obligation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling you you should probably do it so have not obtained knowledge annahu la ilaha illallah that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah wastaghfir li dhamma istighfar Seeking forgiveness for your sins is an act. We understood that. To have knowledge is what? The start of the ayah. So it's a prerequisite to the action. Have knowledge of La ilaha illallah. Have knowledge of Tawheed. 
Go and seek forgiveness. Because imagine a person who has no fundamental understanding of Tawheed so far as he fell into shirk, full shirk and he left Islam or someone who's not even a Muslim asks for forgiveness. Why isn't that forgiveness accepted? Because he hasn't met or she hasn't met the prerequisites which is knowledge of Tawheed and acceptance and acceptance on that. So our last point of the day inshallah Or our last section is with the Lord. If I asked, brothers, this way, if I asked you all to love Mahmoud or to love Amina, what's the first thing that comes to your head? What do you ask me when I just told you to love someone? Why? Who? Why do they deserve it? I mean, who is this person anyway? Right? That's the first thing that comes to your head. Who is this person? Then how is it possible, anyone, can anyone tell me well, how is it possible that you love Allah, love His Messenger, love the Deen, and you have no knowledge of it? This is what is known as lip service. We need to critically... This is lip service. All we do here is lip service. Everything we're doing here is lip service. And on the hardship, as we've stated, on the hardship, what are we going to realize? That it was just lip service. That in the grave you will come, even though you knew, La ilaha illallah, that Allah is your Lord, that Muhammad is your messenger, and you knew your deen is Islam, you'll be, like, uh, 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 you'll be in a state of shock that you will not even bring it. Or has memorized the whole Quran and leads Faraweeh. What happens when you leave Salah or a group, a large group is behind you? What happens? You get nervous, right? And the Quran you knew for a fact. You knew it, you knew it inside out. What to it? You start making mistakes. All of that because of what? You're nervous of few human beings behind. They probably know less because you're the person who's leading less about the Quran in you. That is what you're getting nervous of. Now imagine the angels that were created to scare you. They're perfect. How are you going to remember them? You are not. Unless you are firm in this dunya. And you know this inside out, and you have lived it, you have acted on it, and you have starved or come under great level of hardship for it. That's the only way you're going to remember it. Brothers and sisters, if you think you're going to remember it any other way, you're very much mistaken. This is the only way we're going to remember this, is to know it inside out, to act on it every day, and to come over to every brother and sister and to teach them and to tell them and to inform them and to advise them about the deen and anyone anything as small as even a negative reply you have to be steadfast that's the only way you will qiyamah or the grave you will be able to stand firm Wallahi brothers and sisters if, you're not gonna, if you can't stand firm in front of your own soul, you can't stand against your own soul and tell yourself, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can't tell a member, a human being, as weak as he or she is, no. The what chance do you stand in front of the malaika? Really, no chance. That is the reality that we know, but we need to realize. There's a difference between knowing something and realizing something. When you're young, you might know something. When you're old, you come to realize something. That's why you have 80% of old people regretting. Why? Because they've realized their potential. They've realized their chance. Everyone knows that university, you have a very good chance of getting a good career. Everyone knows that you have a very good chance of being prosperous in the dunya and in the akhirah. But when will you realize? That is a question. Nothing else. 
Some people realize in the dunya and yawm al qiyamah they are prepared. And some people, ya laytani, qaddamtu. That I put something forward, anything forward. And notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my life. Uh, the person says, my life. In the Quran. For this, why? Because the reality is then. I put something forward for now. Is that where we're, we're waiting for to realize then? Or to realize now? We should realize now. So. So with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two main sections. Now, I'll try to make it as clear as possible because there are sections within sections. The first three fundamentals, which was, can someone tell me? The first three fundamentals we just talked about. Mm. Knowledge, second, action, third thing, patience, perseverance, and calling to it. Okay? Some of the ulama spread the last one into four. And you know, you need to call to it and be patient and be persevering on, your act, on, on what you call to. And, but within ilm, there are three things. Within knowledge, there are three things. So I'll put that down. Within knowledge, within the first principle, there are three things. The first is that you have knowledge of Allah. The second thing is that you have knowledge of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the greatest creature to have ever walked on the earth. The third thing is Adin, what he came with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have just explained that it's not possible for you to love him, it's not possible for you to sacrifice for him, it's not possible for you to be devoted. None of that is possible without you knowing what you are doing and what you are sacrificing for. Is that understood? So with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's, there's two main sections that he... So we're going to get to those three fundamental principles of knowing your Lord, knowing your, your, your Prophet and knowing your deen later. But there is a section just before that, that the Sheikh explains, that is very important. But I can't really organize it into the main sections. That's the two main bits to the kitab, but there's a small bit in between. And that is that you know you have a knowledge. This is the relationship between you and Allah, is that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khalaqana that he created wa razaqana and he gave us sustenance every last one of you had food and sustenance and are fully clothed mashallah wa lam yatrukana and he has not left us just like that it is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us gave us sustenance and just left us like that some theology, um, philosophers say that that's what they believe in. That God has created us. They believe in God. So they believe in Rububiyyah. They don't believe in necessarily that He has anything in day to day lives or a day to day action befitting. No. It's incorrect. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for a purpose. Because if you're just like that, then you are purposeless. You are no more significant then I can't even think of something because everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا the one who created death and life وهو الذي خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا and he is the one who has created for you everything on the earth so everything you see has a purpose to say that then you have no purpose is to not even be in the same level, on the same level as animals, plantations, buildings, anything you see. Because everything you see has a particular purpose. So you have, so what is your purpose? And we all, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not left us alone. But how was this purpose given to us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there were two possible routes. Allah chose one, the first route is directly, the second one is through a messenger. And this messenger was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the proof for this? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
inna arsalna ilaykum rasulan shahid alaykum kama arsalna ila fir'aun rasulan da inna arsalna ilaykum rasulan that we have sent down for you or to you a prophet shahid to you kama arsalna ila fir'aun rasulan like we have sent Fir'aun a Fir'aun al-Rasul fa'akhad afwan fa'akhadnahu akhdan wabila and fa'asa Fir'aun so Fir'aun disobeyed his messenger fa'asa Fir'aun al-Rasul so Fir'aun disobeyed his prophet. And what were the consequences? That that I just want to get a precise uh, translation. That he seized him with a severe punishment. So why is it that the Sheikh put this as evidence? That first of all, it, you recognize that you have a prophet, and secondly, the consequences that you have a prophet just like the past people, and that you have consequences like the past people. The Fir'aun, Fa'asa Fir'aun, Nur Rasula. The Fir'aun disobeyed his prophet, so Allah seized him with a punishment. So if you disobey Allah today, what will happen? What will happen? You will get punished. You will be seized. So that's the first proof. And the proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khalaqakum wa razaqakum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, created you and gave you rizq well, is Allah الذي خلقكم ثم رزقكم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah is the one who created you and gave you rizq ثانيًا so the second principle is إن الله لا يرضى that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is, is not happy with what? and you should that you associate someone with him in what? in ibadah no aim brought close or a prophet sent as a messenger. That is the second person. What is the proof for this? وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا That verily masajid Allah so you do not call unto anyone along with Allah in the masajid. And as Sheikh Fawzan and some of the ulama explain, the masajid is the masajid well known, and also the masajid could be masajid in Arabic could be also mean that the places of sajda. That the places of sajda. What are the places of sajda that you make sujood here? The forehead, the nose, the hands, the knees, and the feet. Lillah. There are Allah's. So you do not submissively prostrate to anyone other than Allah. Limada, why? Because these are the places for sajda. And that's what some of the ulama have explained it. Some of the ulama have explained it as in the normal masajid. 
and you are not allowed to put anyone other than Allah or make dua to anyone other than Allah or to call on to for assistance any anyone other than Allah. We're going to stop there inshallah. We'll carry on next week. Uh, brothers, um, brothers and sisters, or brothers? Uh, it's possible for to pray at the back, beginning of the lesson, so they don't waste time coming from the prayer room. Okay? And we will have, inshallah, dates and drinks for those individuals who fasted, so we'll just have dates around. And you can, you can break your fast here as well. Just to just for time's sake, because we really need to, I'm sorry that I went over eight minutes, we really need to keep on top of time. And I hope that you benefited today, and to keep me in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.